Bonjour Strasbourg, bonjour Europe. Hello. Hello Europeans. Hello everyone. Guten Morgen. Hello everybody. We are Nuria and Marta. Good morning. Dzień dobry. Hello. My name is Gabriel. And I am Mihai. Bonjour à tous. Hola. Buongiorno. Guten Tag and hello. Ladies and gentlemen. I am Azad. I'm 16 and my grandparents came as guest workers from Turkey to Europe 40 years ago. I am Bahar, I am 17 and my family escaped the war in Afghanistan 28 years ago and came to Europe. Isn't it uncommon that two people with Asian ancestry represent Germany? No, it is not. That is what we've learned. To get in contact with people from all around the world is what we have to do. We're here in this assembly full of young people with irreverence and a desire to live in a Europe which we want to be more more equal, fairer, and freer. Because in Europe, we are so much more than just a market. We share dreams, wishes, and the past. We're, we're freedom, we're democracy, we're a united Europe. We're all in this together. Obrigada. Thank you. Since 2009, I've been I have now, uh, the last couple of years, been one of the 14 vice presidents of the European Parliament, so very pleased to be here in that capacity to address you here this morning. So um, I, by profession, am a lawyer, uh, but right now I'm a full-time politician. Now, I don't want to uh, give you any kind of a long speech. I want to hear your questions. Mr. Wieland, I have a question. Um, obviously, we're from Germany, we're from Hamburg, and I wanted to ask you you question of interest to us, uh, our situation, AFD is now in the Bundestag and I wanted to ask you what you think the effects on the EU are likely to be and possibly on other European countries. How are we going to deal with this phenomenon? A lot of European countries have seen a shift to the right. I mean, you've got a problem in France and Germany as well as in other countries. Well, first of all, let me tell you that it was like uh, being in on two different planets, if you like, last week. So uh, I was in Brussels and I was having uh, meetings uh, of the bureau of my party. Obviously, was not happy with the election results. And then, well, I'd been there at home and then got to Brussels went to the political group meeting on the Wednesday and all kinds of other colleagues from other countries were coming up to me, congratulating me, saying, oh, you know, well done. You know, but the result wasn't that good. I mean, Mr. Breda, uh, my Romanian colleague said, I mean, you've just got to uh, take the positives from that. I mean, it is great that we've got uh, Mrs. Merkel uh, steadfast in Europe, but it was as though there were two elections going on, because the fact that the AFD did so well is regrettable, but we do live in a democracy, and what we now have to do in Germany, and I say this as a German politician, is is make sure that we um, put those who've been elected uh, on the spot, call into account, but we also have to appeal to their voters. And I have to say that if I look around the European Parliament, then we don't only have right-wing populists here, we also have left-wing populists. I mean, you've got Tsipras, he's a left-wing populist, for example, and he's uh, in coalition with an extreme right-wing party. I mean, you've got this difference of people made between the populists and the extremes. He's in government with a right-wing party in Greece, and then you've got the right-wing populists in France, but in the French parliament or in the French presidential elections, you also had a left-wing populist candidate um, who got just as much support, and then you've got the Grillo people, the Five Star Movement people, who are populists in Italy. And so I think that we need to make sure that we as a society do not start fraying at the edges. Because basically the two extremes uh, end up um, 
meeting one another. I mean, in France you saw that, as elsewhere, you've got populists working according to the same playbook. They use fake news, um, they go in for conspiracy theories, they play on people's fears, and so we have to make sure that we talk to those people in our societies who have trouble coming to terms with change. Uh, I like to know uh, what, how will affect uh, the Brexit, the economy and uh, the stability of the uh, European Union. Well, I mean, we don't want the Brits to leave. I mean, you've got people in the Parliament who say that, you know, the Brits have always complained about uh, Europe, so um, let them go. But certainly a majority does not wish to see them leave. Now, in my own region, Baden-Württemberg, have a lot of young people who know about Europe thanks to uh, Franco-German partnerships, and a lot of them have done school exchanges in the UK, and so I very much regret what is going to happen. It's going to create all kinds of problems, but I don't think they're on such a scale that we won't be able to deal with them, and I think that the problems for the UK will be much bigger than they will be for the rest of Europe, to be frank. Now, as to how the negotiations are likely to pan out, well, there are lots of things about Europe that different European countries don't like. I mean, a lot of things people haven't thought are that great. The European Union, however, is not an a la carte menu. You can't cherry pick. You can't simply pick the bits you like and ignore the rest. It's not going to change either. So, the problem is, you've got people wanting to leave who think that once they do leave, they'll still be able to uh, have the choice, choice slices of the cake, if you like. Now, if the UK wants to stay in the single market, it can only do so if it is a fully-fledged member, so 100%. It's got to continue, therefore, with freedom of movement for people, and the European Court of Justice will have to continue to rule um, on single market cases. And that is something that the UK have got to decide. I mean, society is split. And uh, the latest figures I have heard is that over 40% of Brits would like another vote once there is some kind of result of the negotiation on the table. So they want to vote on the end result. Now we're negotiating, the Brits are negotiating, there's nothing wrong with that because, I mean, we have our own interests as well. We just have to wait and see how things how things develop. Hi, I come from Barcelona, from Biarro Global School, and I wanted to ask you something about the conflict between Spain and Catalonia. So what do you think the Spanish government should do in order to solve this situation? Das war eine sehr schwierige Woche. Well, it's been a very difficult week, very difficult week for all of us, across all of the political groups, particularly the big groups, because they have members from Catalonia. And the impression has been created in the German media, I'm sorry to say, that Europe somehow should be intervening or Europe should be doing something. But that's just not on. I mean, we might find someone, come up with, I don't know, a former commission president, uh, you know, Jacques Delors, somebody who could step forward and serve as a mediator. I mean, that would be okay. But Europe is not responsible. This is not a matter for Europe. The issue of how a state organizes itself is a matter for the state itself. In the UK constitution, well, I mean, they don't have a written constitution, but still, they decided to allow a referendum in Scotland and the reason that came to take place was that somebody who wanted to be Prime Minister said, if I am elected, then I will allow a referendum in Scotland. And they had to enact specific legislation. And they also had to decide on whether a referendum should be binding or not. 
In France, the president can decree a referendum. In the Netherlands, it is something decided by the parliament. They decide whether or not a referendum will be binding or not. Now, until we had the Lisbon Treaty, people used to ask me, well, why can a country not leave the European Union? Now, a country can. We're seeing that in the case of Brexit. But I've never been asked why a state can't leave the Federal Republic of Germany, quite simply because that is something that is not foreseen by our constitution. And uh, one of uh, the first pieces of research I did uh, at university um, was a minister uh, then declaring um, exit from the Federal Republic. And I argued that the uh, federal uh, army will come in and arrest uh, a regional prime minister if that were the case. That's just what would have to happen. And each country has to decide this for itself. Now, there's a, an impasse, and I think that political discussion what I need, one-sided unilateral declarations of independence are not a way forward. Sending in the police is not the right way forward either. But if the Catalans do decide to leave, then, I mean, well, that's, you know, if the Catalans do decide to declare independence, well, then they will be outside the European Union, outside the European Union. And as things currently stand, I can't see a situation in which the Catalans would then subsequently be able to join the European Union because accession requires consent from all countries. So we have to, of course, deal with one another very sensitively in Europe and we should be talking to one another more. And certainly the Catalan and Spanish uh, authorities should be talking to one another far more. Ich will Ihnen noch einen Hinweis geben. But perhaps I can just leave one idea with you. Earlier I talked about an organization of which I've been a member since my student days. It's a cross-party organization, a movement, and it has a youth branch, Young European Federalists, a JEF or YEF. And you're talking about young people who network across Europe. So if you have an interest in Europe without wanting to uh, descend into the political arena, then have a look at young European uh, federalists. Um, it's, you, you'll find it, I'm sure, in your respective countries. Ye yef.uk possibly it's jef.de in germany uh, in fact i came across a small grouping of the same organization in kosovo recently so in, in any of the bigger classical university towns there are sections very often of the young european federalists uh, so you join them and were i to encounter any of you in that particular context in the future i'd be delighted thank you very much indeed for your attention The main themes we talked about were promote sustainable development, recycling and protecting the environment, and the restrictions of the EU. First, we think that we must promote a sustainable way of life with campaigns, exhibition to change the behavior of the people. We must also go into primary schools and Child, young children must integrate the right values that help to the development of a sustainable way of life. Also, we think that celebrities or the world leadership have a certain a kind of influence on the young population of the countries and we must use it. Then, using social medias is very important so that people will know the consequences of our actions and how we are supposed to know how to protect the environment and make people aware of the real problems of this world. The first was women's equality, linked in with the rights of the child and gender equality. We proposed that universal maternity rights for women be put into effect in the European Union 
to ensure that mothers can spend adequate time with their child, adequate development and adequate needs are met. And also the possibility of paternity leave for men. And so that this is streamlined within every European country in order to show these values to the world. In Denmark, for instance, maternity pay is taken from personal taxes throughout a person's life until they become pregnant, when then their maternity pay is paid for once, it, once they become pregnant. However, this leads to high taxes and we therefore were not able to come to, a conclu to a, another conclusion in that matter. The second issue which we spoke about was international crime. And we proposed that international crime registration become at the forefront of our society. Acts of crime and terrorism can be monitored by previous offence which have been committed. And we believe that if individuals who have committed offence are monitored, this can prevent crime, this can prevent terrorism, and this can ensure that we have a safer society. More interaction and governmental transparency is needed with organisations such as Interpol, which work all over the world. However, organisations like Interpol have a disconnection with the common citizen, for we do not know how they work, and they have suffered cr from corruption, they have suffered from disconnection with the people. And we must ensure that we avoid target targeting personal privacy rights as much as possible, even though it is impossible in our society. And that we believe the rights of privacy must be maintained, both online and in our lives. Transparency is essential. And we agreed that both financial aid and non-financial aid should be provided. And in terms of non-financial, we should uh, focus mainly on education and not just uh, education in the terms that uh, we know it, but uh, educate on wider topics uh, such as uh, sustainable farming, uh, building, uh, so on and so forth and uh, educate the older generations as well, not just the children. And in this way, we help them create a sustainable system on their own. In areas of conflict, uh, the European Union should not take sides and not be involved in the conflict militarily, but uh, should act as a mediator between all the sides and uh, provide communication and, uh, if possible, try to p prevent conflicts in the first place. And in case of financial crisis, the European Union should focus on the European countries and uh, focus on the inside before we s provide help on the outside. And the uh, financial crisis is um, a solid reason for cutting back on uh, the resources provided, uh, but we can focus more on non-tangible support. So uh, we've got some keywords to for the values of our future, like equality, education, tolerance, development, cooperation, work, and liberty. But uh, after voting, we conclude that we must promote and improve the four freedoms of the EU that are freedoms for transport of capitals, people, services and goods in the EU. So to conclude, I wanted to say that we are all the future of Europe. So we've got to say our ideas to change our European Union. Thank you. As human beings and, and as citizens of the EU, uh, we are protectors of the human rights. And so we have to follow them. And by that, uh, we have to offer help. And one of the ideas is called a place to stay. Uh, it's uh, a government housing. Uh, the immigrants would come and they would have a house um, um, sustained by the government. They would get a job uh, and they, the society around them, the country, they would get integrated. They would get the help they need because sometimes 
when they flee from their countries, um, they are fleeing from war and from traumatizing events. Uh, and sometimes they need a psychological help or even something else. How do you want to integrate the refugees specifically? Um, we talked um, about um, educating uh, the society around these uh, groups of people um, by uh, educating the children in school, um, educating the adults, um, basically teaching everyone about everyone's cultures because everyone has a right to their culture. It's not because they're moving to the, the EU countries that they have to lose their heritage, that they have to lose all their tra traditions. Firstly, we believe that by offering paid apprenticeships and internships for young people, this can act as an incentive for sustainable living throughout Europe. Secondly, by creating European job centres, including ones online, this can promote and give job opportunities between countries across Europe. Also, by increasing financial resources for young employees from pre-existing programmes such as the European National Fund, Another idea was that by reducing the age of retirement, we can allow more youth employment in companies, including the training of young people from older and more experienced employees. These reduced hours would help ease people into retirement and encourage young people to gain training within their job and workplace. Finally, by creating benefits for young employees, including student loans, student discounts and cheaper public transport, this can allow an easier and more affordable way of life for young people within Europe. In conclusion, we believe that together, Europe can promote and increase job opportunities for young people by offering financial support from the EU, training young people for employment and providing substantial information to promote youth employment. Thank you.